currently the deputy mayor of the Office of Children and Families at the City of Philadelphia. Um, have been in this administration almost since the start, uh, and prior to that served as the CEO of Congreso de Latinos Unidos, had the distinct pleasure of working with a number of my fellow panelists. Um, so it's an honor to be here, and thanks again to CHMC. I'm native of Arecibo, Puerto Rico. My mother is from Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and my father is an American-born Cuban, and I identify as a Latina. Thank you. Thank you. Pedro? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Pedro Ramos. I'm president and CEO of the Philadelphia Foundation, where I've been uh, a little bit over five years. Um, and I, also, I sit on a number of uh, uh, company and nonprofit boards uh, as, as well, and uh, uh, have been involved in you know, most of my professional life, sort of in things that cross government, nonprofit, business uh, sectors. I'm a, a, a Philly Rican. Uh, I was uh, born and raised in North Philadelphia, uh, you know, on the, between Front Street and Broad Street, between, you know, Spring Garden and Girard. Um, uh, and uh, my family, uh, you know, is, I'm sort of first generation high school. Uh, my family came from uh, uh, a, a very rural, very poor section of, of Puerto Rico in Arecibo and in Lattice, Puerto Rico, um, and uh, came to the U.S., came to the continental U.S. in, uh, in 1953 with a couple kids, and I, and I was the, the youngest uh, born here, and, and, you know, one of the things that I say in terms of talking about them coming to the continental U.S. was that a key part of this discussion for me is sort of the pointing out that the U.S. came to us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Pedro. Jennifer? Uh, good afternoon to all and uh, thank you for having me here today. I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, an organization that has uh, been dedicated for the past 30 years to supporting the scaling um, of Latino owned businesses in the in Philadelphia and the region and really supporting wealth creation um, and entrepreneurship uh, in general uh, in Philadelphia. Um, there are over 12,000 Latino owned businesses in the city of Philadelphia, 22,000 businesses in the region. So we are uh, in many ways, not only the backbone of the American economy, but really uh, a very, very important segment of the economy locally and regionally. Prior to this work, I was the executive director of the mayor's office of immigrant and multicultural affairs under the mayor Nader administration. Um, which was one of the joys of working with vulnerable um, immigrant communities, learned a lot in that work. Um, and uh, born and raised in Puerto Rico and came to the U.S. as the main export of Puerto Rico is people not products. And so I'm, you know, one of those that came here to get a, an education and found that the United States became my, you know, the mainland became my homeland, if you will, and have been in Philadelphia since 1998. Thank you. And I should share, I am Cuban. Um, my family came when I was um, very young and we initially um, arrived in New Jersey, a little town called West New York. And then I came to Philadelphia to attend college and, and here I am stayed. Thank you again for joining us and participating in this discussion. Let's get right to our first question. Interested in hearing all of your perspectives. The terms Latino, Latina and Latinx define a culture or ethnic group, not a racial category. How do you define Latinx ethnicity? Who wants to start us out? Roman? Well, uh, perhaps I might just jump in here and because in pre preparing for this conversation, I was actually doing a little bit of homework, which is my want. Um, and I came across a couple of uh, 1987 Supreme Court decisions. Um, and I was interested because, you know, we look at ethnicity as um, somewhat different uh, from race. Uh, and it, it's confusing. I mean, when you look at trying to figure out what are the statistics associated, uh, the demographics of the, of the Latinx population, it's sometimes really hard to 
put together what that picture looks like. Well, you know what? The Supreme Court in 1987 said, and looking back at the legislation that emanated out of uh, the uh, U.S. Civil, um, uh, the, the, uh, Civil War era and uh, the 1866 and 1870 Civil Rights Act, basically the Supreme Court said there is no significant difference, at least from a legal perspective, and the protections afforded Americans between those two terms. And uh, uh, with respect to what legislators in 1866 thought about race, it, it not only reflected our current views about being um, African American or Asian uh, or, or whatever, um, but it also reflected um, um, national uh, origins uh, that might be distinctive, religion, et cetera. And in the context of a civil rights case uh, that emanated out of um, the um, uh, Pennsylvania federal courts, the Supreme Court said, practically speaking, relative to the protections of uh, this um, 1866 and 1870 um, civil rights statute, we should be looking at ethnicity as having the same legal protections as race. That's terrific, That's Romy. Uh, uh, and in classic fashion, Romy debating the, you know, the predicate or the premise of the question without saying it. Whereas I would say, I want to debate the premise of the question. Maybe that's very Because uh, <laughs> yeah. I also want to debate the premise of the question, which is, look, um, you know, we've, I think, well, first of all, I think, you know, Latino is a con like these phrases are all constructs, things that we've created for sociological reasons. And, you know, I, I had no idea what a Latino or Hispanic was till I got to college, right? I, I was a Puerto Rican from Philly. That was my whole universe. Didn't know many people outside of that universe. Um, and, and when I found that my universe in college was like one, and then maybe a couple African Americans from North Philly, and we needed to figure out like how to, you know, how to find more community than that. And we started sort of buying into these terms we never heard before. But let's you know talk about for race for a minute in the Latino experience, because I think it's one of the things that it sort of demonstrates how the experiences of different Latino groups or Hispanic groups or you know the Puerto Rican experience, the, the Mexican ex, uh, uh, American experience or the Tejano experience all sort of get wiped out of history and even in our own sort of progressive narratives, right? Um, as Romy points out, you know, white folks never thought of us as and as white uh so this idea that it's not that race is sort of out of the equation this is about ethnicity um you know manifest destiny which justified sort of american sort of expansion sort of white man's burden which sort of justified sort of european sort of colonialism they were all grounded in a in a justification of race towards our folks like the idea that we needed, that our race was sort of inferior and we needed to sort of, uh, and that sort of was a reason to subjugate sort of other, other lands and peoples. Um, and when you think about sort of, you know, even some of our sort of, some of the great poets that have come out of different uh, 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 Spanish speaking places that, that were colonized, um, you, you, you know, you have this, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, you, uh, you, you, you have people who have identified themselves as sort of a raza, different razas, you know, over, over time. Uh, so, so, you know, it's why we become uncooperative on things like the census and we tend to like check the other boxes and then like fill things in if we get a chance to, <laughs> to do it. And, and it's also, I think, at the local level, one of the things that sort of glosses over a lot, you know, we talk about sort of social determinants of health and all that, um, and it really has, I think, been to the detriment of, of really underserved communities in this area that, that, um, that we sort of collapse these different experiences, immigrant experiences, sort of different experiences driven through sort of power and violence dynamics in the U.S., um, all into sort of 
you know, a, a neat little box that makes us sort of sound international when it, when there's a distinctly, when there are distinctly American experiences here that were sort of forged by American ideas and European ideas of race at the time. Pedro, you brought up the U.S. Census. Um, I, I guess I could lead us to the next question for those um, people in the audience who don't maybe don't understand. Well, why do some um, people consider the term Hispanic um, used by the U.S. Census as for any of our panelists as um, offensive? So, Sarah, I'd like to jump in and, and tie it into the previous question because I think the the points that um, that Pedro made where I think we're starting to set up. That this sort of the the answers to the end of this question, but I would say like in in my personal universe, the context of the term Latino became very important because, you know, you're so a, attached to your own personal identity identity and how people ask you you identify, right? That's often something that we do, um, and having you know from a very young age being born on the island, having a mother who lived her entire life in Central America and a father who lived between Cuba and the US, it became very difficult. People really wanted to push me to say, was I Honduran, was I Puerto Rican, or was I Cuban instead of, mm -hmm. so I felt like the sense of relief in this, in, in the, the concept that, that Pedro was talking about in terms of La Raza, that I was part mm -hmm. of the Latino community. And I felt like it really helped embrace the context of um, sort of a larger sense that you, it's, it's so multifaceted and our families and our community are, are, are so vastly different depending on what region you're in. But uh, you know, specifically then as it relates to the, the alternative of Hispanic, which um, you know, in the 80s, similar to what Romy ha highlighted in terms of the conversation that was having in terms of civil rights was that it was really an alternative to the term Hispanic being used, which a lot of people obviously refer to the colonization. Um, it also indicated, you know, from a very specific sort of a historical context that it was Spanish speaking individuals and not Caribbean and a lot of other individuals who fall into the category of Latino, but not necessarily, um, you know, the, the concepts of connecting you to colonization. And I actually looked this up too. I, my, I did my homework too, Romy. Um, you're always a good mentor and reminding us to do that is, um, you know, I think it, it says it really well, like Sandra Cisnero, who is somebody whose readings I've, I've followed closely, she actually refuses to have her writings included in any anthology that uses the term Hispanic. Um, and she went on to say that it means you've been so colonized that you don't even know for yourself or someone has named you. So, I, you know, I think for a lot of Latinos or I, those who identify um, and identify in various different other than terminology that even falls within, you know, like Boricua, Chicana, like there's, it, it, you know, the layers go further down that, um, that it's offensive. And it's actually often a term that you see used more politically than socially. If I could just add one more quick thought, Sarah, to that, sure. <laughs> to that um, uh, question. I, everything I've heard, I, I would agree with. Um, but you know, a, a friend of mine uh, who is um, publishing, I don't know, his umpteenth book, um, contacted me recently uh, on a Sunday in a, in, a, in a frenzy because he had to get his manuscript to his publisher uh, later that day and was asking me the question about, you know, how do I refer to this community? Is it Hispanic? Is it Latino? Is it Latinx? You know, whatever. And I said to him, and I think we probably all on this panel would agree, I said, use them all. Uh -huh. Because the reality is that we all identify a little bit differently, and these are all made up terms. And, um, and I recently read, for example, in connection with Latinx, only 25% of the Latino, the Hispanic, uh, the Chicano population of the country has even heard of the term. Yeah. Only 3% use the term. Yeah. Uh, and so I think it's like everything else that we do. We have to meet the customer where the customer is. And so in connection with delivery of health services, to your customers, I think the idea is let them choose what works for them. And until they do choose, use all of those terms because you don't want to create that box for them. 
And I would, I would echo very much that, you know, being somebody that works very closely with the community and where communications and relationships and trust is very important, choosing one over the other. And particularly, this is a little bit of an academic discussion that we're having, not necessarily the on the ground sort of experience, right? Um, really, I would say, um, you know, we use them all interchangeably. Uh, a lot of people do not know the difference between one and the other, frankly. Um, and that a lot of it has to do with generations, right? So you'll find that Latinx really is an emerging term where the millennial population is much more likely to understand and identify with it than older generations. And so, um, you know, many organizations, uh, Latinx, Latino or Hispanic organizations around the country are finding themselves in this position in which they're really looking back at their origins and the names that their organizations uh, may have had the name Hispanic in it and are really rebranding and thinking that that this names and uh, you know are carry some weight with them. So I think we're in the community we're really still evolving and as and don't catch yourself necessarily choosing one over the other. Let the customer choose is what I would say as well. Great points and things to keep, keep in mind. Let's talk about stereotyping. Um, our next question, there are non-conscious stereotyping of Latinx clients in public health, government, and social services. In your experiences, how has prejudice manifested itself and what are some of the effective ways to mitigate it? So, Actually, I had a conversation around this topic um, not too long ago. In fact, this past August, um, the Hispanic Chamber invited um, journalists from different um, from different newspapers and media to have a conversation around who's telling our stories. Um, because uh, what we learned in the research is that the media has an incredible role to play in the way that others see who we are as Latinos and also how do we see ourselves. So I think this goes more over to the second part of the, of the question around what are solutions to this problem. Mm -hmm. And I think engaging with media and that is very important. We learned that um, only that the over 90% of the stories that are told about us in the news media are about immigration or crime. While we make up, you know, immigra immigrants is, you know, are not the majority of Latinos in this country or in this region, yet it's 98, 99% of the, about 97% of, of, the, of the stories told about Latinos, right? Also that we are overwhelming, overwhelmingly represented as, uh, you know, landscapers, low skilled laborers, um, you know, and that just builds on the stereotype. So there's a lot to be done around communications and engaging media and telling more complete stories about who we are. And, and I would say that's an important step to take. And from a personal perspective, you know, um, one thing that you probably have noticed in looking at this panel is um, how different I look uh, from the other three panelists. So, you know, one of the things I've always had to address in terms of people reacting to me who didn't know me uh, has been, you know, well, what's your background? What's your origin, et cetera? A lot of people believe that you know, I may be Asian uh, as opposed to Latino uh, in origin because of my features. But what you realize in terms of our community, you know, and land bridges millennia ago <laughs> that disappeared, is that you had indigenous populations that have um, moved, uh, you know, all over the globe, and particularly in Latin America, and even within our own community, you will see people who are um, who have nicknames in Spanish relative to how they look. Do they look Asian? Do they are you know are are they black or dark skin um, uh, or, or or whiter uh, than than most, etc. We have all these nicknames within the community, but that doesn't mean that we are not and don't self-identify as Latino or Hispanic or Chicano or whatever the case may be. So one of the, one of the 
things that I believe that the question really um, uh, touches upon is, you know, should we be looking at, um, you know, distinctive physical features in trying to ascertain whether somebody is Latino or Hispanic and the reality is absolutely not. Um, and it goes back to what I was suggesting earlier, let people self-identify, let people tell you who they are, uh, how they how they see themselves, and uh, and I, I think we have to be careful not to make those judgments for them. Yeah, I just want to jump in because I think that that at a at the most personal level, that is so incredibly true. And this panel, I think, highlights and and represents that it's it's such a diverse community, and this concept that you would never hope ha can happen even within an ethnic minority is like not being Latino enough or, you know, having having questions around, well, well, what what is your family background? Because you don't look Latino or you don't, or your Spanish isn't good enough or all of these really incredibly insulting um, things that folks can say in terms of like how spicy a food do you like to have, which is, you know, was like completely ridiculous to like a conversation you would have with a particular <laughs> region of folks from Latin America versus other. So the, the stereotypes are consistent. I think the most significant, and I just tie this into what was said earlier, that the, this, this separating the, um, the community from a race um, conversation puts people in a situation of then the stereotypes being further perpetuated because I think just not the independence of a loan being described as a Latino and that on its value standing, but having to have this perception that you need to look a certain way, speak a certain way, having been born on the island or not on the island or first generation or not, um, is, is definitely something that I have, you know, I've personally struggled with. <laughs> Um, and also see it as a way that I unfortunately think begins to divide the community and also begins to divide us from other minority groups where I think that there could be uh, a lot of benefit for us working together around particular issues that are similar facing our communities. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the lot, you know, I, clearly the Latino community sort of has found some you know, communities of in some community of interest around a lot of things. And I think that actually Spanish media has created more of a unified Latino identity and culture mm -hmm. uh, almost than in, in any other, you know, for me, the stereotyping is, is frustrating in that it, you know, it often reduces language is a big issue for mm -hmm. a, a lot of folks and reducing things to language and culture really erases both the the circumstances of the community that most of you are serving, uh, and uh, 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 and sort of wipes out sort of everything that has happened to those all the trauma that's sort of been inflicted here in the U.S. Uh, 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 on these communities is sort of just gets wiped out in this sort of creation of this of of a you know, of, of something that's merely cultural. I mean, before there was Brown of, of Brown v. Board of Education, there was a case called the Menendez case involving, Mex you know, involving Mexican Americans around school segregation, uh, lunch counter segregation in, in, uh, in uh, Texas, uh, jury selection litigation, right? I mean, uh, excluding uh, Latinos from, from jury pools, uh, you know, uh, getting to the point that they're are you know specific factors impacting these you know specific communities in North Philadelphia? You're in the Latino community in Philadelphia. You have some of the highest, uh, lowest levels of literacy, highest levels of of, of high school uh, dropout, some of the worst uh, 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 health outcomes, some of the worst uh, in the city of all groups. Sort of you know uh, expected livelihoods, um, and we. You know, and day to day, we sort of keep um, uh, glossing over, you know, glossing over the uh, the circumstances of of these circumstances that have now been intergenerational. It's not like, you know, here's a you know an immigrant population, and the next generation will be fine. There are there's a unique experience here of concentrated intergenerational 
poverty and violence that is associated with having grown up Latino here in the community that you're serving. Um, and I think it's, in, you know, it's incumbent on folks that want to serve in that community to understand that, to take the time to not get the glossed over version, but to understand the experiences of those communities if you want to really begin to serve them because the outcomes right now are not, you know, are not sort of playing out in a way that's showing progress. And, and to some extent, you've got a community that's as insular, insulated here in Philadelphia now, or probably more insulated than it's been, you know, um, throughout the last 20 or, or 30 years. So I, you know, I do want to just kind of beat, beat that dead horse, you know, of a point of, uh, of since given this an amazing audience that we're talking to of folks that are really in service uh, to this population. And so Sarah, the, uh, uh, to, to, to continue the riffing, <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that caught my attention about uh, uh, our community um, uh, was based upon a report that I was looking at um, uh, in, in the University of Texas um, uh, uh, publication, uh, but based on uh, the Johns Hopkins data and a New York Times report, what was shocking to me was that um, Blacks and Latinos, unfortunately, share uh, you know, a common um, uh, uh, attribute, and that is that they're three times uh, as, uh, uh, as likely as the white population uh, to, um, uh, to uh, contract coronavirus and twice as likely to die from the coronavirus as the white population. So at the same time that we're saying you can't lump everybody together, there are certain um, uh, community impacts being felt health-wise, education-wise, um, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of income that Pedro that was talking about that have to be understood by health professionals, folks like yourselves who are delivering services to this community, because this community is is, is severely impacted by uh, many of the ills that we find in our society today, and we shouldn't ignore those either. Yeah. Well, and the reality is that the term becomes useful because resource allocation is in many ways associated with how you are, you know, how a certain group is, is, is sort of classified, right? So it's hard to get away from, from, from those terms. One thing I would say in terms of prejudice and, um, uh, and how to solve it is, um, you know, and I work in the entrepreneurship sector. I don't work necessarily in health services and social services, but um, there is a foundation, uh, uh, Aspen, uh, did uh, did a lot of work around um, entrepreneurship and why is the Latino community also in many ways just really not up to par or not on par with non-Latino entrepreneurs, right? And one of the things they 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 sort of recommended ultimately um, was that we needed a communications campaign that really portrayed Latino entrepreneurs as successful, right? And I think there's a real need to really place Latinos or underperforming, you know, in terms of uh, disparities, uh, communities in the light of success. Um, there is a foundation, the, the We Are All Human Foundation, that has a project called Hispanic Star. And the research that they the, the, that foundation has done really points to this social phenomena in which Latinos, there's a, there's sort of like a low self-esteem in our community that really seems to be preventing us or influencing the way that we behave and whatnot. I mean, this is their promise, their premise. And so they have developed now this campaign uh, that is the Hispanic Star. And it's all about finding the people in our communities at all levels and placing them in a really positive light to inspire others to follow through. And I wonder, in, in the world and in the in the sphere in which we work, 
uh, you work, whether there's an opportunity to really show success in health, success in, in whatever metrics uh, it is that you, that you work or you, you track. That's actually a segue to something I wanted to talk about next, and that's career pipelines. Um, how do we create um, career pipelines um, for budding professionals, thought leaders in social services and education and healthcare? Um, my question to you is, how do you as an organizational leader create these pipelines and encourage, as you were talking about, the Latinx community um, towards these fields? Um, what, are, what have we been doing and what, what, can, what should we be thinking about in terms of encouraging and, and, and maybe, like you said, maybe the more views of role models and success stories? Um, other thoughts? So I would say that, um, that not unlike the general, um, you know, thinking right now in connection with how you develop a successful organization, uh, and, uh, and attract talent uh, to the organization. You want people to, you know, it used to be that people talked about recruiting talent. Now they're talking about attracting talent. You wanna basically create an organization, develop an organization that is so attractive to others that people wanna come in. Well, what makes an organization attractive? It's because they have people like you. They have people in the organization that look like you, know you, um, that, that you, can, um, you can associate with and feel like you can bring your whole self to work. So from the perspective of what a pipeline looks like, it's clearly got to include staffing and leadership that looks like the population um, that you serve, right? Uh, it, the things that you're doing right now with your DEIA, uh, D, DEI Council um, is absolutely on the mark. You got to you got to have a focus for doing this strategically within an organization, uh, and you have to show that it matters at the top, right? The, the thing that you're doing now with affinity groups, you know, I might, uh, you know, refer to it as a as a uh, an employee resource group, um, but whether it's an ERG or an affinity group, you want to have people understand the value of the whole as opposed to the pieces parts. And what do I mean by that? You wanna have, uh, have a group of employees who understand that A, they can benefit their employer, they can benefit their community, uh, and they can uh, serve as a bridge to bring back information from the community to the organization so that it uh, does even better in, in terms of being successful. But you know what? It's the American way to also give the employee an opportunity to benefit himself or herself in terms of their career development, um, you know, plans. Uh, so you want it to, um, to to serve not only the organization and the community, but have it serve the employee. Those are the ways in which I think you have a really um, uh, attractive and uh, uh, and progressive and I think more successful organization, that's how you start creating that pipeline. And I just, I wanna add to that, that um, you know, obviously the, your own employee network is incredibly important. Uh, we do a lot at the city to talk to college and university students, uh, as well as high school students and, and students that have the opportunity to do some of our summer internship programs. Um, and so those are the audiences, but here's what I would say that I have found to be very powerful, which is that on any given day, not every, not every young person has a moment to read about the extraordinary professional career of a Pedro Ramos or a Romy Diaz or a Jennifer Rodriguez. Um, and they just see this, these people who have arrived. Right, and there's then quickly becomes a lot of assumptions that they must have come from this, they must have done, you know, all those things. I think it is incredibly important that we tell our stories and we tell the struggles of our stories, um, and that not um, to sensationalize an experience, but I do think it is vastly important that. The young people understand that it was not. I, I, I didn't. I'm not in the seat because it was an easy path, um, and there were a lot of people who helped me 
And so I, I would say the other beautiful um, environment that the Latino community has provided to me in Philadelphia is tremendous mentorship. But it also took a moment of vulnerability, right? So I would just say our personal stories are our biggest value to teach the next generation that it is a lot of hard work, but it's completely doable. That a lot of the stories that represent from generations before us are almost exactly identical to the issues that many of the young people are facing um, in Philadelphia and in, and in the nation. And you know, when I started my um, board consulting practice um, that I mentioned earlier that I call Turtle on Post, I chose that name for a reason. You know, I, I heard a story about um, a religious uh, leader who had a picture of a turtle on a fence post behind his desk and a reporter asked, what's that all about? And he said, anytime you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he didn't get there by himself. And <laughs> I, know I didn't get there where I am by myself. And everybody, as, as Cynthia mentioned on this panel, had somebody along the way who took a personal interest. You cannot underestimate the value and the importance of one person taking a personal interest in somebody and helping them be successful ultimately. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's so important for organizations to have leadership that get that, to have, to understand the benefit of like a critical mass. People talk about, think about diversity often in tokenist terms, right? But it really, I think, takes having a critical mass of folks um, uh, that, uh, that, that, you know, having that diversity really, in critical mass enough to really attract other folks to know that they can find um, community wherever they work. Exelon does a great job of that. Blue Cross does a great job of that. Comcast has you know, done amazing work there. And uh, so really want to give a kudos uh, uh, to, to, this, uh, to this effort. Um, uh, we have but, time for one more the, the question. One, the, the, I wanted to make a point on sort of a sort of a PHMC specific point, uh, not about where you guys are, but to kind of share reflection, which is, you know, when you talk about pipelines, it's think about the extent to which um, in service to community, we often over inflate the credential requirements and thus exclude served communities and impacted communities. It makes me think of a time in the district where we had a pipeline for paraprofessionals to have to get credentialed and, 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 and schooling to be able to advance to teaching positions. And I see in the social sector sort of a lot of great work for a lot of great master's degrees with very few people in served communities having those master's degrees. And, 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 uh, and sometimes we think of that as quality being reflected by those credentials, but oftentimes we're also uh, 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 excluding, you know, not, not building paths for, for folks to really uh, be able to enter and advance in organizations in a real pipeline and almost force the dynamic where folks are being served uh, by folks who really have less connection to community. All great points. We have time for one more or final comments before we're going to move on to the Q and A uh, section. Um, how have you addressed Latinx cultural competency within government, for-profit, and nonprofit organizations you have been involved with? You might have touched on some of this, but uh, those will be our closing remarks, and then we'll move on. So, um, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of things that we've touched on, but I would just highlight that, uh, you know, um, in government, we, in this administration recently, there have been a creation of the resource groups. So um, there's a, a wide diversity of resource groups among the staff members um, to base, to in create sort of those synergies across multiple departments because um, you know like like government like anywhere government can operate in silos when you have something that's that large and complex uh, so that's actually grown to be incredibly important for our staff to have these circles where they can come together to work on etc um, and then you know i think that the other piece we haven't talked about so i'll just throw this in here is that an, uh, i would 
argue that all of us on this panel have been asked to serve on a multitude of boards um, and committees and councils, et cetera, um, as much for our um, executor prowess, but also because we come as the Latino brand at the table. And so sometimes that gets into the tokenism. And I think my attitude or my approach has been is like, well, you asked me to the table, so careful what you ask for. Uh, <laughs> so I think that it is, is of critical importance that when you have the opportunity and are brought to the table, that you have to bring yourself entirely to the table. Um, because often you will be the only person at the table that's representing a particular constituency. Unfortunately, you're starting to see that change more, but there's a, I, I, I wouldn't put this on other people, but I would just say that I hold a tremendous responsibility when I'm brought to the table and I might be a small representation of a particular community, whether that's being a woman, whether that's being a Latina, that um, it, it's important that you push people and make them feel a little bit uncomfortable when it's clear or evident that uh, the issues that need to be surfaced do get surfaced and are addressed. I think one thing I would say if you're, uh, uh, you know, the, I don't know if the question is around how do you um, create cultural competency in your organization, um, but one of the things that I would say it's it always, um, when I used to work at the mayor's office, uh, you know, our office was responsible for language access and, and, inst and giving an education program to the police department on how to deal with immigrant communities and, and how to really better, better interact with them. And um, it would always really uh, surprise me how few had ever traveled outside the United States to another country and immerse themselves in another culture how few of them had ever really participated in the cultural festivals and activities of the communities they served, or even how few of them had ever really gone to a foreign food restaurant, Mexican restaurant or, or Arab food restaurant. And I think ultimately this is about building relationships one-on-one -on -one and really um, acquiring or learning respect for other cultures. And it is very important that for us to really, in some ways, experience somebody else's life, in, in a, even if it's in a minimal way, in, and acquire respect for them. And, and perhaps, um, you know, and in the immigrant community, we, you know, we saw communities in South Philadelphia building bridges by, by doing community gardens together, immigrants, refugees with, with receiving communities, right? Um, and so um, I think that it sounds like you're doing a, you know, it's a cultural activity, but it really can be much more than that if that can be integrated into the operations and the work of the organization. Thank you for all your comments. I'm going to ask Marlon to move us to the q and I want to make sure that the audience has an opportunity to interact and pose their questions. Marlon? Or Um, Marlene, are you there to um, pose the questions for Rachel? If not, we can. Oh, I was muted. Yeah. Great. Thank, thanks, Celeste. It's been a uh, it's been a wonderful and rich discussion up to this point. Um, now we're going to transition to some questions from staff at PHMC, and I'm going to jump right in. And, and these questions are for any of the panelists, um, any of the panelists to answer. Um, so one question. Um, there was a statement about the phrasing Spanish speaking places that were colonized. Um, there was a statement the colonizers were the ones who brought who brought Spanish. Have any of our panelists felt any tension around indigenous Latinx people in communities having different ex experiences than other Latinx folks. They said uh, they've heard from some people that La Raza has the effect of erasing in indigenous identities. Um, anyone have any, have a response to that? I think I would actually say two things uh, in response to the question. Uh, one is that, you know, this is a struggle I've had internally <laughs> all, of my, all of my lifetime. Um, you know, on the one hand, 
you know, I've got first editions of the conquest of Mexico uh, and, um, uh, and, and the conquest of Peru in my library because I'm extremely sensitive to the notion that, uh, that good and bad came from colonization. Um, and there was good and bad already there in the areas that were being colonized. And how do you respect both of those traditions? Uh, I, I think um, it's, it's an area that per persons like myself continue to struggle with because I think there's value and, um, uh, and, and a lot was uh, inherent in indigenous societies and, uh, and much of it was lost but a lot was also gained. Um, and, and, and there's a balance that's needed, uh, I think, there. Um, I, I would also say that um, in connection with um, uh, the, the fact that people are, are raising those questions suggests to me that there's been a lot of thoughtfulness among the employees of PHMC. You're really trying to understand your customers, and I think that's great. And yeah, I just want to offer as a, a sorry, Pedro, like as, a, as, as an example um, of something that just recently happened on a national scale was one of the largest, probably longest standing uh, advocacy organizations representing the Latino, Hispanic, Latinx community was the National Council of La Raza. And they went through uh, like a five year process around their name and they felt actually Interesting enough that um, the term La Raza was actually excluding a significant portion of folks who felt that that was more A, indigenous, B, southwestern, and not actually enough connected to sort of the Caribbean and um, other sort of other Latin American um, context. So even with, it's back to that, you know, like all terms, but terms are important and that we're continuing to evolve through them. So they're now called Unidos US versus La Raza. And that was a very painful process for them to go through to rename themselves, but felt that they were transitioning to a new era that had to be more inclusive. So I just offer that as an example of a real day sort of um, experience that uh, a national organization went through. And, and, you know, it's important, you know, to also understand sort of the different indigenous experiences across the con across the North and South, Central and South American continents. And, and in the Caribbean, I mean, the uh, sort of the, the, uh, the genocide of indigenous was swift by disease and otherwise very early on. Uh, and by the way, when I refer to, to colonization, you know, you're talking about two types of colonization, right? You've got the colonization by the Spanish and the Portuguese and, and the British, but I mean, the colonization I was talking about was, you know, people don't understand their own American history, which is, you know, Puerto Rico was taken by force. It was, you know, it was a bounty of war. Um, and it was just like the Navy showed up one day and, and hey, you're no, you're, you're now, you now belong to us. And, and, you know, most of the relationship since um, has, has had a, has been one of some form and different degrees of sort of domination of the economy, big shifts, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, it, it, it is also pointing to, you know, there's a legacy here uh, with some with, with some of these with some of the communities in the U.S. that was created. You know, that was created through those relationships of force, uh, and uh, and and certainly the Puerto Rican experience and diaspora here to to the continental U.S. is influenced by uh, by that, uh, which you know America has certainly um, benefited from over the years. Great, thank you. I, th I think we've got time for one more question from from um, staff audience here. Um, one of our staff was interested in hearing from our panelists your, your thoughts about if and how colorism influences dynamics in the Latinx communities. Well, not very, I would say not very different in the United States. The lighter the color of your skin and the straighter your hair, the higher the status is by default given to you. 
I mean, I, that's how simply I would put it. Put it. I, I would yeah. agree. And I, I think falls into the stereotypes that we talked earlier about how Latina are you, you know, um, so uh, it abso absolutely um, is reflected in even um, how individuals identify in sort of the separation of race versus ethnicity. Yeah. And, and it goes, and it's not just black, white, it's sort of black, white, and it's also indigenous when you talk about sort of the, even sort of Mexico or the Mexican American relationship or the Mexico relationship. Yep. Um, uh, 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 you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the racial, you know, uh, issues tied to indigenous populations in each of those is, is also a huge factor beyond the black-white binary in the U.S. But, you know, I would, I would uh, agree with everything that has just been said, uh, but would pivot slightly. And, and that is, that, you know, growing up as a kid in um, East Texas, <laughs> um, you know, uh, in a Catholic family, I, I went to um, to uh, Catholic Church on Sunday uh, to Mass. But during the week, I went with um, a, a woman who was our babysitter because my mom worked. Um, uh, both my parents worked when I was growing up. Uh, and uh, I would go to, um, to a um, fundamentalist black uh, church, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the community um, during the week. Um, and what I realized ever since, because I've had really close relationships with the African American community and value them, what I would say is that, um, and this is the pivot, we have more in common than I think we have, um, uh, you know, differences. Uh, and I think it is really important for us, particularly in this moment, to recognize that it's not about one particular um, uh, racial or ethnic group, um, you know, getting ahead. We all need to get ahead together. And many of the challenges that you've heard about in terms of the Latino community are shared and in some cases are worsened in other communities like the African American community. And I think the more we know and learn about one another, the more we can help each other to move forward together because that's how we're going to actually do some fundamental change in this country that we all need and can benefit from. Thank you to all of our panelists. We're almost at time. And I just wanted to, again, thank you for a rich discussion and for the contributions that you make every day through the work that you do. And I will turn it over to Celeste. Thank you. Well, thank you, I mean, Romy, if I may, I just met you this in the past hour, but I'll, I'll tag on to your, your nickname. I'll say that I'll, I'll double down that we absolutely have more in common than we, than we do not. And that, that is in terms of our challenges. It's in terms of our accomplishments. There are so many. Um, it's in terms of our needs. So I think the more we can pull on each other and draw on each other, that's when we will succeed. Um, there is much more to do. This has been a rich conversation. Um, you know, there's more to do. As Cynthia said, and I, I, this is something that lands on me all the time, we did not get here um, easily and we don't stay in these roles easy as well. So once we are here, whatever it is, personally or professionally, it does take um, it does take a lot um, based on what we, our personal goals are, and I hear that from you all. So I want to thank you all for being here. There are a few people that are, you see on our, pan that our audience sees here today, and I want to just um, call them out and thank them for their planning with this very important discussion. Twiggy Rodriguez, um, Angie, Almore Gilbert, and Michael Pearson, who really brought the, the, um, the conversation of panelists together. Thank you all for your contribution this afternoon. Um, thank, you for a thank you for the richness um, in bringing all we did with our employees this afternoon and our esteemed panelists. We hope to continue. These are conversations. We're not so much here to resolve, but really come together and have discussion amongst peers and, and share our experiences. So I thank you. Um, good afternoon to all of you and um, give thanks. So long, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Happy Paige. Thanksgiving. Be well. See you as well. Thank you.
what's on your dinner table for Thanksgiving? <laughs> That's the question I want to know. <laughs> Less than previous years, Michael. <laughs> but Thank enough you. for two people. <laughs> and I hope you have a great, happy, and safe Thanksgiving, Michael. Thank you. And I appreciate the engagement. I mean, this was wonderful. Uh, it was a, a, a very deep discussion. And the questions, Marlon, I hope we copy these so that we can address them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we didn't get to some really great questions. Um, some of them were very much directed at PHMC, which makes sense. And I know we, when we have the few minutes that we have for questions, we try to um, identify universal questions that make sense for um, for the you know for the panelists to be able to respond to. But it is our commitment to be able to get back, and it also informs upon some of the ch some of what our employees are seeking um, in our planning. So it makes sense. So thank you. Very Thank well. you, right. Michael. Thank Thanks you, Thanks for including us. Bye -bye. Sarah, great job. Great job, Thank Sarah. you. Okay. Yeah. Have a good day.